Hello everybody, it's Sarah here from the Squiggly Careers podcast. Just before we dive into today's episode, I just wanted to borrow you just for a minute or so to let you know about a new program that we're launching all about Squiggle and Stay. Some of you might have listened to that episode a couple of weeks ago, or maybe you've read our new HBR article on reimagining retention. And as part of our commitment to making careers better for everyone, we're looking for 10 organisations to work with who are really keen to experiment with how they can support people to progress and develop in different directions in their organisations. So hopefully we'll bring lots of ideas and collaboration and we're looking for people all over the world to join in with this programme. We're looking for about 10 organisations and if you want to find out more, you can email me at sarah at amazingif.com Or if you go onto my LinkedIn page, you'll see a Squiggle and Stay post, which has a PDF all about the project. And we've got two calls set up on the 20th of July and 1st of August, where your organisation can find out more. So I really hope that feels relevant for some of you listening. And we'll now get started with today's podcast. Hello, I'm Sarah Ellis, and this is the Squiggly Careers podcast, where each week we talk about a different topic to do with work and hopefully give you some ideas for action and tools to try out that are really going to help you to navigate your squiggly career with that bit more confidence, clarity and control. And I'm not joined by Helen this week because this is one of our Ask the Expert episodes where we see someone who we think is doing some really insightful and useful work in the area of careers. Usually they've got a real kind of deep dive perspective on a certain topic and we really want to talk to them to find out more, to get their words of wisdom to share with you. And so today's guest is Jennifer Moss. And Jennifer has a great new book out called The Burnout Epidemic. And I first came across her work because I read a sort of deep dive, I think they're called Big Idea, article that she wrote for Harvard Business Review, which we will link to in the resources. And I would really recommend taking the time to read the article. And then if that sounds interesting, you can learn more by following her on LinkedIn and kind of looking at her book and the work that she does. And what I really like about her perspective on burnout is that it feels more nuanced than just saying, you know, we're all stressed and we're all working really hard. I feel like she has really taken the time to bring together the science of the topic with then her experiences of what really helps, but also what she's seen work really well for individuals and for organisations. So I hope you find this episode helpful and I'll be back at the end to let you know how you can learn more. Jen, welcome to the Squiggly Careers podcast. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. I'm so glad to be with you today. It's going to be a great conversation, I can already tell. And so we're going to dive right in to the topic of burnout, as it is everywhere at the moment. It's on the front of magazines. I see people writing loads of articles about it. And it's certainly a term, I think, that feels increasingly familiar for all of us. You know, I think we hear the word in conversations much more than we used to but I'm not sure that everyone means the same thing when they kind of use this phrase of burnout. So I'd really be interested to start our conversation today with what does burnout mean to you and what's a useful definition that we can work with as we progress through our conversation together? So I think that's a foundational question because I really strongly believe that the reason why We haven't treated it as well. We haven't had the right tools to prevent it. Organizations and leaders themselves are sort of, they've been lost and we've pressed sort of burnout on the individual to solve is this lack of definition, this nebulous way we think about burnout. I really tend to lean towards what Dr. Maslock, Dr. Michael Leiter, Dr. Susan Jackson, all three of them really have been promoting 40 years in the making until 2019, where the World Health organization define burnout as institutional stress left unmanaged workplace phenomena. It is a condition of micro stressors over time building up until we hit that wall of burnout. And it's serious. I mean, in in that same year, the ILO put out that overwork was the cause of 2.8 million deaths annually. So that was sort of in tandem. They wanted to say, okay, this is serious. We have to pay attention to it. And it shows up in these three major signs. So high levels of depletion. So just 
feeling exhausted at the end of the day. In the morning, you feel like you can't get yourself out of bed. You're, you're still depleted. You're sort of losing track of, of your work. You need stimulants sometimes to stay awake during the day. And then you need ways to then relax at the end of the night, which feels impossible. We also see it show up in sort of a lack of emotional connection to our work. We stop feeling like we're good at our jobs. And then that cynicism piece, which we really saw grow in the pandemic, just this feeling of hopelessness and unable to actually make change to our situation. And you put those together, you feel that over time frequently, and then you hit that wall that we call burnout. And I might be making an assumption, so you can correct me if I've not gone down the right path here, but certainly from everything I've read, it feels like we are in a worse position than we were certainly pre-pandemic. So I was reading um, some of your research, which described, and I think we can all associate with this, that basically in the last couple of years, most of us have had this always on experience when it comes to work. We sometimes describe it as these blurred boundaries where, and I think the stats were, we now have 12 or 13% more meetings. Our days are elongated by sort of 45 minutes to an hour, which actually that's just a day. And you can imagine how much then that adds up. And it feels like the kind of expectations on us in terms of what we need to deliver and how productive we're all meant to be almost feels overwhelming in terms of when you really start to kind of paint this picture. So I'd just be interested just to hear your reflections and how the last couple of years have either changed burnout or perhaps accelerated some trends that you were already observing. I, absolutely. The pandemic exacerbated a whole bunch of existing problems that were already there and, and uh, getting to a boiling point. And this just sped up, you know, the boiling point, really. What we sort of saw in the research and data, you know, and I've been researching this for a while and sort of looking at the kind of the number of people that were experiencing symptoms of burnout in the workforce was around 40 to, to 45 percent, which was still significant pre-pandemic. And you saw that in, you know, in fields like healthcare, even more at risk at burnout. And then you see it in tech and production focused environments like finance, et cetera. So there's certain industries that were already more burned out and at, at risk before the pandemic. But then in the pandemic, we started to see numbers like, you know, 90%, 77% in various sectors. Right now, just in Canada, there was a recent study of nurses and 92% of Canadian nurses are female and 90% of them said that they are it hit the wall, burned out. Wow. The numbers are really quite catastrophic. And the culture of always on was leading up to this. I mean, technology and the, the social contract had changed already leading up to the pandemic where it was, you know, here's your technology. You can answer now at 11 o'clock at night in your home. So there was already an intrusion. And then we saw, I mean, Microsoft trends data that just released the 2022 trends report said that we have increased our meetings by 252% in the last Last two years. It was about 167% before, now it's 252%. So there's these other aspects of the pandemic that led to flexibility, which was great with remote work, but it also became a bit of a curse in that we have no bifurcation between work and life. There's other factors that are playing a role in why the pandemic has increased burnout so much, but a lot of it just has to be that fact we're dealing with a macro stressor and then you have these, uh, you know, increased workloads and meeting fatigue and all those other factors that are making us increasingly at risk of burnout. And one of the things that I found really fascinating when I was sort of delving a bit deeper into the work that you've done is I do think there is an automatic assumption or certainly I think I approached your work thinking burnout equals I've done something wrong. I get that it's bad for me, but almost maybe I have made some bad choices and this is something that I need to take control of and almost beat yourself up. You kind of beat yourself up because potentially you've got to burn out. And if I think about some of the people that I have worked with and talked to over the past couple of years, that's certainly the narrative that I hear from people. They're giving themselves a really hard time and, and they're having a very hard time. You know, they're sort of definitely in burnout and they're sort of blaming themselves. And I think what your work has showed is that Firstly, that's not the complete picture and that this is a we need to think about both what's happening in organisations and from an individual perspective. So I just wondered if you could talk to us a bit more about that dynamic, that sort of difference in terms of who owns this challenge and who solves this problem, because I don't think it's as simple as this is my fault and then therefore I need to sort this. I think that, you know, when I wrote the book, 
and why it was, you know, quote unquote provocative, it was pushing more accountability to leadership, to organizations, even, you know, policy and government and, and global expectations and societal expectations. And it was saying this is a we need to look at this in a much broader way. We need to tackle, you know, burnout prevention with solutions that are much further upstream. We've been sort of placing it on the individual to solve with self-care alone. You know, here you just breathe better or yeah. just say, <laughs> just say no to work. It's that I mean, that's a privilege that very few people can have access to, you know, more yoga and sleep better and all yeah. those things will just impact your burnout. And and that felt so frustrating to me and disingenuous because when you look at the root causes of burnout, there's no way that, you know, listening to rain on an app for 15 <laughs> seconds is going to eliminate systemic discrimination and, and lack of fairness inside of organizations, which is a root cause of burnout. So I wanted to look more at understanding, you know, where it starts and there are these root causes of burnout and they're very institutionally based. We do need to still, especially as leaders model self-care, mm -hmm. we do need to have self-care in our lives. That's really important. We, as leaders, especially have to say, I'm going to take my weekends and not connect. I'm going to, you know, not look at my emails and text and communicate with you after work hours. I'm going to take an actual vacation. So these are things that we still need to do. But a lot of why we blame ourselves, not only because expectation to solve it has been squarely placed on our shoulders for the last, you know, however long yeah. we've been talking about burnout, but also what happens when we experience chronic stress over time, we develop these symptoms of chronic stress that include brain fog, which is this sense of you know, not being able to focus, feeling like you have to work harder to get to those same goals. Mm -hmm. You make more mistakes. You're more irritable. So there's more conflict. So you have less, you know, conflict resolution. You're more likely to just want to be heads down in the work and your productive relationships start failing. So all these things that get misdiagnosed as underperformance are actually chronic stress. And so you start to question, well, I must just be underperforming. I must just be in disengaged. I guess I'm not good at my job. And so I deserve this, or it's my fault that I am now burned out. And we don't track back to say, actually, these things, this overwork, these unsustainable workloads, feeling passed over for promotions because of, you know, whatever racial bias or prejudice exists in my workplace or feeling bullied or lack of psychological safety at work. All these things have created this chronic stress, which has then forced me to not be as good at my job. And then so it's easy to say, I'm just bad at my job. I don't deserve to be here and ignore the burnout piece of it. Any other examples that you've seen of either things that individuals have done well or organizations? So particularly if you're someone listening to this right now and they are thinking, what Jen has just described is absolutely me. So I'm, you know, like you're thinking, I am that person. I've got all those characteristics that you described. I am feeling depleted. I do need something to get me through the day. Where would you sort of encourage or support people to start? If you've sort of got the awareness that you recognize the burnout feeling, where do I go after that? As you know, inefficiencies are just the bane of every organization's existence. And, you know, why can't we reduce meeting, you know, have guidelines where we assess who should be there, who's the attendees, who are necessary? How do we get people to feel more comfortable about politely declining a meeting yeah. and create cultures of being able to say, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to offer as much value to that meeting and not feel like that means that you're not a, you know, a, a good employee or a dedicated employee and make people that are organizing the meeting, not worry so much about overlooping or hurting someone's feelings by not inviting them saying, Hey, I'm going to give you some time back. And also being much, if you're going to host a meeting, have expectations on that host that they set a very strict agenda. So if someone can come in at 10 15 and leave at 10 25, you give them a time slot where they're going to add value and then they can be off. And these are important things that we do. We should do an audit. How much time are we spending in our salaries on not just meetings, but time theft? When we go over and we think it's okay to steal people's time, you know, when you look at those you know, modes of actually meeting, we're just, we've sort of fallen victim to 
it has to be video conferencing. And I think we can get on walk and talks and we can use different modes of communication because this by nature now has become, you know, boring. We've lacked, we lack novelty to it. So people are sort of disappearing. How do you create asynchronous meetings? I mean, these are all tiny tactics that we can start to practice. And that's what a manager or an, a person, an individual and inside of an organization can just start doing today. You know, saying, hey, guys on my team, girls on my team, we're going to now be much more respectful about our stealing time from each other. Like there's going to be like penalties on going <laughs> over and, and make it fun. Like, you know, like a swear jar, right? Like, you know, you, you put 25 cents into the yeah. a minute, <laughs> a, a minute that we go over a meeting, like find ways that are novel to keep them short, have stand up meetings. You know, all these are very s- simple tools to give people time back. And when you see this in that 32 hour, four day work week, you're very efficient with your time. You're very careful with other people's time. You are not worrying so much about process. Your work, you're more focused on just getting to the goals, having shared goals, all meeting those without it being an individual's job to have to, you know, get to their goal by the end of the week. Again, these are things that we can start immediately tomorrow when we go back into the workplace and start to create some structure and have dialogue about how do we get our time back? And the more we can get our time back, the more we can get our work done in the day, the less urgent needs knock us off of our path, the more respected we feel. And then that gives us time to actually do some of these other things that we think are frivolous that aren't like creative thinking time and innovating okay. and being a competitive company that actually, you know, might increase their revenue and growth without burning their people out. And so there, there is a possibility ahead and it's not an overhaul for us to get there. And I think what's so interesting is often when I talk to teams about maybe some of their current ways of working or behaviors, and I'll sometimes be a little bit provocative and sort of give them a, I like to think of it as a nice nudge, but I am, you know, I'm sort of testing a little bit. I'll often say, oh, tell me why you do that. You know, a why question always feels more challenging, certainly than a what question. And I'll say, well, yeah, tell me why you everybody has to be in those meetings. Tell me why you have all those notifications turned on that are interrupting you all the time. And I think so often we have fallen into working in certain ways that we didn't choose or that we didn't co-create. And so I will often just at a kind of small level, if I'm doing a program for a team, I'll sort of say, well, so what is stopping you from just trying a 15 minute meeting rather than a 30 minute meeting and I think often people's answer is that oh it's sort of just always been that way and we, we're we creatures of habit so you sort of go well that's comfortable we've got used to maybe just not challenging or asking those questions I actually think though you, as you describe them as yes they can be small and simple but I do think they can have a really big impact even in our team like this morning I did a walk and talk with someone in my team so every quarter we do walk and talks where we're just talking we're zooming out We're asking questions about, you know, what are you really proud of at the moment in terms of the work you're doing? How are we getting in your way? You know, I'm always interested to know, how am I getting in the way of my team? Like, what what am I missing? What do you need me to stop doing? Or what do you want me to do less of? Those kind of unlocking questions. Now, we didn't need to sit and write anything down for that conversation. And actually being on the move was a good thing. Look at your week. Where are the opportunities to, like, like you say, gain some time back or give some time to someone else? Or are you clear about that meeting? And if you're not, why are you in it? Or what is it for? Is that, I think, um, Priya Parker's work on gatherings is is really relevant in this area because she talked a lot about single thing you've all got to do is just be purposeful about like, why are you getting together? Like, why are you meeting? And if you've not got that purpose, it sort of all falls down quite quickly. Yeah, I was thinking actually very relevant to somebody I was talking to very recently Often I think when you are experiencing burnout, it feels really hard to help yourself. Perhaps you don't feel like you can go and talk to your manager about it because probably if you could have done, you already would. You know, if you'd got that psychological safety, you'd probably already have had the conversation and you've sort of reached a point where I think often people feel quite helpless and they've lost a lot of confidence. It's certainly been my observation. Is that because you've described, you don't feel like you're using your strengths. You sort of lose that sense of, anything that I'm good at and for me we talk about in careers the moments that matter and I see that as like a high risk moment that matters because that could be a moment where somebody then sort of makes a decision that doesn't mean they're going to you know limit their potential or limit their learning because they are in this kind of 
burnout state with is that because you, you've got brain fog how can you make good decisions for you and your career in that moment and so when you sort of see people go from burnout to I guess that tipping point of then not being as burnt out what are some of the tools and tactics that you see sort of that we can do individually if you do recognize I'm in that state so I don't want to make big decisions about my career because that feels like a real high risk moment but equally I may, maybe they've tried in their organization and they feel like that kind of help or that support might not be there because it's a tough that's a very tough experience isn't it for people it, it is a, a really interesting sort of pathway to to becoming burnout and and some people have different experiences as they right. get there. And I think it's really interesting. So in the book, I interviewed Dr. Marie Asberg and she's based out of Stockholm University. And she talks about sort of this path to hitting the wall. And so it's important for us, especially in the ecosystem of preventing this big problem inside of an organization, we have to play a role in understanding and labeling where we're at. And a big part of it is just, you know, now over the last couple of years, because we've been in this state of emergency for a really long time, we still think it is an emergency, but by definition, emergencies are unexpected, right? And so we need to sort of take pauses in our own life and recognize what are the habits that we've taken with us through the last couple of years. We are so much more responsive and we think everything's urgent. And it's also a personality of high performers. We've seen a lot of people who tend to be at risk of burnout already because they are perfectionists. And it's good to have perfectionist strivings where we have a desire to hit goals. But when those that turns from perfectionist concerns, according to research, what it means is that you know, we start to see all or nothing results. And that is, you know, one mistake is definitive of who we are as individuals. And we're getting very attached to our work to the point where it threatens our confidence. And so we need to pull back right now, I would say as individuals and say, okay, what are some of the habits that I pulled through? And how can I try to figure out ways to get out of those bad habits. And it, it needs to be that we ask more questions of our stakeholders when they ask us for things. When someone says, I need this thing, do you just expect it's right now? Or do you ask, you know, do you respond to emails as if they are 911 calls all the time? <laughs> or do we have to pull back and assess? Can we use our out of office in a much more, you know, valuable way? We use, we assume we're supposed to use them for just vacations or time off. We should be using our out of office to get work done in the day, you know, set up a out of office that says, I'm just going to be heads down for a couple hours working on some pressing matters. Please email me and I'll, I'll answer emails at this time. If you have emails pinging constantly while you're working, you can't, focus. You can't concentrate. So managing expectations is one way to give your, yourself protected time. We need to also recognize that we're in a rest deficit. So we not, you know, we don't just need sleep. We need other types of rest. And this is based on Dr. Dalton Smith's work. And she's really, you know, has been saying like, we're really lacking rest, but we need creative rest. We need, you know, social and emotional rest. We're on you know, all day and we've depleted our relationships that actually fuel us. We're spending more time with relationships or, or even just work that drains us instead of finding time, which happens when we're burned out, finding time for those people that give us that sort of effortless state of belonging, that sense of comfort where you can be yourself with that person. Mm -hmm. And so there's, you know, these other aspects, we need spiritual rest, which doesn't necessarily need to mean that it's organized or faith-based. It really is just sometimes, you know, having moments of awe in nature and realizing that a lot of our stresses are myopic. So there's things that we can do and recognize that because of this state of being and because of the demands of work and all those other reasons that are not, you know, in our control, that we can control the controllables. And so that's how we, we take some of that, you know, some of that power back and we re-engage what matters. And the final thing I'll say is I've been really, you know, through my own burnout experience, and this was actually pre-pandemic. So I was fortunate in the pandemic to 
have some of these tools, <laughs> you know, yeah. but before the pandemic, I created this schematic of my life that was deathbed regrets. And if this thing, you know, this, and I'm a big FOMO person because I love my job. <laughs> so I'm like, I want to do that project. Yeah. I'm going to say yes to this. I am say yes to that. And it isn't because, you know, that I'm a, a people pleaser as much as I just like, I'm getting Get excited. excited. <laughs> and so I have to, I've decided, you know, this project seems great, but is it in my absolute, you know, place of strengths? Is it within my priority schematic? And if it falls away from that, I need to give a lot of, you know, validation for why that has to happen. If it doesn't meet the priority checklist, and it means that I'm not going to eat dinner with my family, or I'm not going to be able to take a vacation this year, or I'm going to be working so many hours that I'm going to be depleted. Well, that is going to impact whether I'm, you know, thinking, did I live my life to its fullest? Did I, you know, on my deathbed, did I have really healthy relationships with people? Did I you know, nurture my best friends that make me feel, you know, complete in my life. And if it doesn't match, then it ends up being a no. And so I think there's things that we can do. We cannot solve for a lot of those root causes of burnout, but can we solve for some of the things that we tend to add to our burnout? Yes. Those are things we need to work on too. And actually that kind of takes me on to my next question, which is sort of zooming out a little bit just before we finish together, which is I'm interested in how hopeful you feel and how optimistic you feel given the you know you've deep dived into this subject which is not an easy thing you know to read about you know a lot of the time you are reading things that you think and certainly as I was reading your work I was like I wish I felt really bad for individuals I felt bad for organizations for whole sectors where you think crikey the people who really care for us because they care so much whether that's people in healthcare or other industries like that are also the people most likely to experience burnout and there's lots of things that will feel quite confronting as you sort of get to grips with the work and and you really want to you, you sort of feel like oh, I want to feel that sense of okay can we make this better because the consequences of not doing that as you're very clear about you know almost like the business case for burnout you can see how if you just everyone keeps doing this it's not going to be good for individuals for communities for organizations I'm interested in kind of where you are at the moment in terms of just kind of what you're seeing, the conversations you're having. Yeah. How optimistic do you feel? I'm a cautious optimistic. <laughs> I think as a, as a journalist, I tend to, and a you know, researcher, you're sort of looking at the flaws in your work and you're also looking at the edge cases, right? And mm -hmm. there's a healthy level of skepticism, but at the same time, and maybe this is where my cynicism is actually, you know, proving true in that when it is, like I said, that bottom line issue, when it is impacting the workforce so much and, and organizations are feeling that impact of bleeding, even their highest performing folks. And, and the latest survey Dan Shawbell actually put out was, um, and it was in tandem with Deloitte, but what he put out was that even 72% of C-level executives are claiming to be burned out. So if you start to look at that layer, mm. who has sort of been buffered, I mean, they do burn out too. There's loneliness, there's other factors, but typically the more agency you have, the more tenure, the better paid you are, those other factors, it tends to make you less likely to burn out. But even that at that level, those numbers are saying, okay, we really need to be careful about how we move forward. And so for whatever the reason is, it is creating a new way, a paradigm shifting way of thinking about the future of work. And even just the fact that more conversations around mental health are happening, you know, bringing in this type of support, these support tools that I don't see them climb back. I see that they've already, you know, thought about yep. it. And there's areas where I see real potential. There's other areas where I'm worried. I mean, you see hospitals shutting down because they cannot staff up and resource their hospitals. So communities are going to be impacted by that in a big way. We're also already in a teacher and a nursing shortage. If we lose those, it, it's a problem already. So that means, again, those vulnerable in our communities are the most impacted by that. So that really has to be fixed. And, you know, in healthcare, there's such a legacy of overwork that it's been very difficult to solve 
call for that. And so again, I'm hoping that something changes, but but I have some fear around that. And then one thing that I, I feel like is this great opportunity that we can't waste is this shift from working in office to having that flexibility. We went from 4% of the global workforce to 35% within two weeks. I mean, just dramatic change. And we're at 28% still. So that's a good number. And I I don't want people to think we have to jam the toothpaste back in the tube, you know, send people back. (laughs) But we also need to reimagine what being at work looks like. And it isn't just the same way that we used to work. We should not ask people to commute into work to be on Zoom. We need to ask them to come back and work and look at this as leaders as this, you have this power to really change the way that we use our office space and our time together. And it should be about team building or work sprints or bringing fun back. I said, you know, work is like going to school with no recess these days, just math and science all day long. And (laughs) for some that's really exhilarating, but for most of us, we want some, you know, fun. And so I think finding the use of the office space and retooling and rethinking what that is for people will draw more people back instead of just saying, you have to be back so that's what productivity looks like when that's not true. That's a myth. And so we need to think, okay, well, how can we make this Goldilocks zone that, that isn't just like, you know, thinking about the office in the same way. And that for me, I'm seeing some of that shifting, you know, Hewlett Packard is a great example where they're giving meals to people to take home instead of yeah. a- asking yeah, you to nice. be life on site. They have a maker space. So when people go there, they can go and just build things and make things and be creative. They're really investing in nature so that people can spend more time working outside and their campuses is being less about the building, but more about nature. So, you know, thinking about what that looks like and also understanding that we do need to have some formula to that. We we're saying just come in any time to work. And if you go into a ghost town, I don't think that's healthy either. You know, let's, let's come up with guidelines that feel right for our team, for our organization and come to that place where it's really like our most optimal experience of work. We know that we can do that now. So I do see that if more leaders think that way and large organizations are showing that that shift and their belief in it, that there is a real opportunity for us to make work, you know, really fun again and kind of this ideal place between work and life. And if we can get there, you know, work is fuel. You and I know this, like when we love our job and our work, it doesn't mean that we don't, you know, aren't at risk of burnout. We have passion, (laughs) you know, driven burnout all over the place. But it does feed us and it is an inspiration and love of work is a buffer, is a prophylaxis for burnout. So, you know, we need to get more of that thinking. And I, I think that's that's the opportunity there if if we jump on it, you know, and, and not see this potential recession or this change as being like, okay, now we have all the control back as leaders. Mm-hmm too bad for employees. I'd like to see this as like, this is a, this was a moment where we faced our mortality, everything changed, the social contract changed with work. Let's do something really cool with that. Yeah. And I think the, as you said, I probably share your cautious optimism sort of sentiment, but the thing I feel hopeful about is that the leaders and those organizations who do kind of create the environments exactly as you've described they don't need to get everything right first time but they're experimenting they're committed to kind of keeping the changes that have actually been a good thing from the past couple of years but also challenging some of the things that we probably had to get used to quite quickly but were never designed to be ideal in the first place I hope that if those places those organizations and those leaders become celebrated and showcased and then they're reinforced by people's experiences of whether that's working in a five-person company or a 5,000 person company they're the places that people want to go and work they're the places that you recommend to your friends that people go yeah it's a, a brilliant place to work I've got autonomy I've got accountability I can do great work that I'm really passionate about yeah there's some things we've obviously always got to be careful about but that it is a different kind of conversation to those ones where you're just going well, you know, where burnout kind of at its worst is such a big risk to both individuals and organisations. So I think one of the things that's really brilliant also about your work is, yes, it's a provocation in terms of responsibility, but you do also share lots of stories about individuals and organisations doing it well and just what that looks like. And as we've said today, it's it's not necessarily 
massive strategic changes that are going to take years to put into place. Lots of them are simple tools to try out and to see what works and to give teams that autonomy to to figure out well what works for us might be different in one industry kind of versus another so I, I I still left your work feeling hopeful even even though like you say it's kind of quite a tough topic at times I still kind of came out going oh there's it made me reflect on on myself but also on the environment that we're creating in our team on the organizations we work with which I think was brilliant and just as we get to the end of our conversation together we always ask our guests the same question just to finish with which is what is your favorite bit of career advice so this might be career advice that you just want to share some words of wisdom or it might be some advice that someone has given you that has been really useful for you in your career or it could be something based on the work that you've done in in burnout but just something that you want to kind of leave our listeners with after today's conversation my saying about life is you can have anything, not everything. And it really is this idea that everything is about choice and, and also just, you know, remove the ego. And I think when I was young and I I had FOMO, I wanted to do everything. I wanted to be in charge of everything. And I was doing things I was really bad at. And I had to relinquish if I want to have, you know, anything, I need much more bandwidth to do that anything really well Mm -hmm. and have a sustainable experience of work and life. And that means bringing people in that are way better at that thing than I am, even if they get to do some of the cooler stuff, or (laughs) I want to do that, but they get to help me do what I'm really good at. So I can have more of that anything in in a better way. That's what I came to learn and and letting go of the ego that you should be doing it all or, or get to do it all, or you're kind of, you know, protecting doing it all. That has been huge. And, you know, over after the burnout piece and just, you have to be really scrappy as a startup founder anyways. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that sort of fell to you, but then you were so worried about something failing that I wasn't delegating or wasn't, you know, supporting other people's growth. And sometimes that takes time. And when you're moving really fast, you don't realize that that upfront time gives you so much more space in the end. So that you can have anything, not everything piece has been really helpful. And it, it changes the way I think about myself, the people around me and, and the way that I can have, you know, my cake and eat it too. A bit of learning to let go, it sounds like. And Jen, if people want to, our listeners will no doubt want to read, watch, listen to more of your work, where would you like to point them to? And we'll include all of the links as always as part of our show notes. You know, there's everything that, you know, you would need social and blogs and information and research. It's all at jennifer-moss.com. Brilliant. So we'll include a link uh, to Jen's website so you can get everything there. We'll also include a few links to a couple of the Harvard Business Review articles that I found particularly useful. That's actually how I discovered Jen's work and just got in touch with her and and hope she didn't think I was too strange being like, hello, I've got a Squiggly Careers podcast, but uh, she responded very positively to which we're uh, very appreciative. And Jen's also got a brilliant new book out, which I'm very lucky that I've had an early kind of proofread of. And I think by the time this conversation comes out, certainly you'll be able to pre-order it. But again, we'll make sure there's a link but Jen I've really enjoyed our conversation today and thank you so much for joining us on our squiggly careers podcast it was such a pleasure thank you so much that was a great conversation I love that you added so many insights too I I learned a few things on the way so thank you for that So thank you for listening to today's Ask the Expert episode with Jen. If you have any experts or topics that you would really like us to cover, people that you think would be really interesting for us to talk to, you can always connect with us on LinkedIn or on Instagram or we're Helen and Sarah at squigglycareers.com and we love to hear your ideas. Maybe you've read something from someone that you just thought was brilliant. You don't have to know them or be able to introduce us. We can always do that bit and we can always ask the question. Loads of people say no to us so we've got very used to just asking lots of brilliant people if they can spend some time with us so if you have got any ideas please do let us know and as I mentioned at the start of today's episode have a look and read Jen's kind of big ideas article on Harvard Business Review because that was really where I discovered her and her work and then really enjoyed kind of diving deeper into what she's doing so that's everything for this week thank you so much for listening and we'll be back with you again soon